from Children's Mercy in Kansas City. A great panel, Bob. Question for you. If uh, for some reason the New York Times lost Art's phone number and called you and said, oh, uh, what are, are you actually proposing to replace the current uh, dead donor brain death DCD criteria for who should be allowed to donate? And tell us in a soundbite. <laughs> what would you say? The soundbite portion is hard, but I'm not sure that good ethics necessarily always has to reduce to a good soundbite. Um, you know, I think that uh, what Frank and I proposed in our book was that if there are patients who are going to have life support withdrawn, who are expected to die, and we have to be very careful about how we develop those criteria, that they should be allowed to donate, that um, that would happen with anesthesia because we wouldn't want them to experience any pain. Uh, and. Um, that we believe that with their consent, indeed at their request, that uh, that would be an ethical choice and it would be a more straightforward and honest approach than what we're doing now, which is to put them through an orchestrated death, which does, which limits the number of organs that, could, that can be procured, reduces the quality of those organs, which is really not what the donor had in mind when they said they wanted to be an organ donor. Thank you. Dan. Uh, Dan Sulmacy here at the University of Chicago. Um, thanks uh, to all of the panelists. I'll uh, particularly thank, uh, thank, thank Bob for um, a, a talk in which after uh, congratulating uh, Jim in the first um, maybe minute of your talk, you managed to say um, almost nothing I could agree with for the next 29, <laughs> 29 minutes, particularly about assisted suicide, uh, rule, uh, rule of double effect, uh, uh, distinction between killing and allowing to die, etc. But, but a lot of that I think was uh, off off the, the central target of the, of the question. I want to bring you back into conversation uh, with uh, Jim about this permanent uh, versus irreversible distinction. Um, and I think you called it a category mistake, and I'm wondering whether it's a, um, not a category mistake to categorize it that way, because I think it's more about the logic of implication. Um, uh, of certain states. And I guess the question is uh, that you're raising is whether um, if um, an event has occurred that could potentially be um, reversed um, and no one intervenes to uh, reverse it, we've made a decision not to reverse it, that that somehow changes its status to not being permanent. Um, and I'll give an example totally outside of this. If I'm running a race um, and I s decide in the middle of it, I I can't do this anymore, and I stop. Um, um, I think I've lost the race at that point. And the fact that I could start again um, doesn't seem to change that, um, nor the fact that it's you know, potentially possible um, that it hasn't been ruled out absolutely that I could win um, changes the fact that I have um, lost the race. So do you disagree with that? As Because uh, I think that's sort of at the heart of the you know, permanent versus irreversible distinction. I, mean, I guess I, I, I don't see that as being at the heart of it. I mean, I see what Jim's saying, and if, I, if I'm reading him correctly, he's saying that permanent is a perfect proxy for irreversible. That once we know something, this is what it says. Okay. Um, I mean, well, I, maybe, well, well, if not, then I'm giving you, uh, I'm giving we, we could ask a Jim friendly, friendly amendment. <laughs> yeah. Jim, is that what you meant? Well, the, um, the idea of permanent and irreversible, it isn't only that it's a proxy. It's that it is the medical standard of care. And that as a matter of medical practice, that's why I wanted to make the distinction earlier between, if you will, an ontological approach compared to a medical standard approach, that we are allowed to do it at that point, and that that's what I see as relevant. Yes, from a practical perspective, it is, it is a proxy. And a lot of the other things we do also are that way. We are beginning to think now about death determination in the uncontrolled donor after um, failed cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And there's a choice that has to go on there too, and that's the choice of stopping an ongoing CPR effort. And that um, there are some criteria that have been proposed for that. Um, but we know that in practice, it's done all different ways. And that we also know that the recent paper published in the Lancet Online in September of this year showed 
that longer cardiopulmonary resuscitations led to better outcomes, suggesting that some of the patients might have survived and also went home earlier. Uh, so some of the survivals were probably okay neurologically. Um, and, but a choice is made, just like the choice not to intervene and resuscitate, making it a contingent event, there's also a choice that goes on with um, when to end uh, resuscitation. There's also a choice that goes on in terms of uh, physicians um, agreeing to allow uh, cessation of life-sustaining therapy. So many of these um, deaths that we would like to have firm endpoints on that seem totally biological and that we are not somehow involved in or complicit in, it's not that simple. Uh, I'll, try, I'll be brief here. Um, you know, Jim, you're, you're saying that uh, because physicians have typically pronounced death at the time the heart stops, that that's a reason why we can declare them dead quickly in DCD. I just want to, I think this really ignores context. If I go to the hospital ward and I see somebody and I listen to their heart and it stopped and I declare them dead, I don't know yet whether it's irreversible or not. But what are the consequences of my uncertainty? Nothing. The child is there until the nurse gets around to coming over and, and packs you know, him or her up and they go to the ward. The consequence is nothing. When we do this in the context of DCD donation and we say that at two minutes you're dead, the, skin, the, the knife comes down on the skin. I mean, to say that we can make the analogy from one to the other and just ignore the huge difference in context doesn't make any sense to me, Jim. No, I'm not familiar with it, but there... No, but the more general question you're asking, and, and I think this is a good panel to ask that question of, is how permanent and how irreversible is the diagnosis of brain death? Are there ever mistakes? Are there ever people who have been shown to come back from such a diagnosis. I guess that's behind your question. Well, it is, because actually I was, um, my husband was in the ICU, and there was a young woman who was 29, had a two-year-old child, and she, in effect, was declared brain dead. And uh, the uh, hospitals, uh, the, all of the ICU, because I was often in the waiting room where some of these consultations were taking, taking place, they wanted the family to remove all life support. And the, the parents and the family just couldn't quite do it then. Well, two days later, I was there when it happened, um, she woke up. And she lived for a couple of days. And then she did have some massive strokes. But she was obviously not brain dead, even though because uh, she, she was able to communicate with the family and respond to doctors and do. Um, so I, those are, you know, that was a very personal experience. But Well, there are obviously cases of uh, erroneous diagnosis. And I think that sounds like was the case here. There have been two well-reported cases of fulfilling the clinical criteria for brain death following rewarming after therapeutic hypothermia protocols to limit brain damage after cardiac arrest, where um, they did recover somewhat. And those, I think, count as uh, true cases of erroneous diagnosis uh, but fulfilled the diagnostic criteria. And what that has shown us is that uh, there's something about the uh, hypothermic protocols in cardiac arrest that should make us wait longer after rewarming before uh, declaring brain dead. But that would be the only exception. Um, more commonly, the term is either used improperly or the testing is done improperly to account for cases like you're describing. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. September? Hi, I'm September Williams, a former McLean Fellow. And I am um, speaking of the Winnipeg Protocol for Frozen People um, coming back. When I was in Winnipeg and school in 1972, I had the opportunity to pass out leaflets in front of a demonstration um, where Chris Bernard was speaking. And I handed him a leaflet. He looked me straight in the eye in 1972 and said, thank you. I mentioned this, and this is directed to Dr. Kaplan, because I believe he had never been handed a leaflet before. When you talk about the difference between constructive engagement, the relationship between apartheid 
at that time and what's happening in China and the use of human research subjects without their consent was, was quite parallel as it has been throughout history with African Americans and Native Americans in this country historically. The question is, is do you use sanctions or do you use constructive engagement or do you use targeted constructive engagement? Um, Chris Bernard was a perfect person to tap his inner humanity and say, you're on the wrong side, man. Come over here, okay? You want to do transplant, but you got to get on the right side. So do you have in the rubric um, a targeted constructive engagement for this yeah, That's task? a great question. And there has been some discussion among people who have sort of rallied to be in opposition. Uh, within that group, you see the whole range. You see the sort of no contact, no uh, interaction on any front with China until they stop the uh, barbaric practice. Then you see more where I am, which is boycott particularly transplant-related scientific and medical activities, but try to constructively engage with people of goodwill in China or who can... Uh, influence people of goodwill in China to keep moving. So mine is the tactical or focused. We're not going to let you report at the meetings on liver transplant outcomes, but we're still going to be talking and maybe other medical meetings you can come to and talk about other things. We're not, it's not a complete ban. I, I don't think anybody empirically knows what's the correct strategy to follow in trying to change a nation state's policy about a evil practice, but I'm sure that part of it in the case of China is to keep the PR focus there. They, they don't like being called out. I can tell you this week, the Israeli parliament, who knew, picked up on this boycott idea, and about 10 of them wrote a letter to the Chinese government saying you should stop the practice. The Chinese government has gone crazy. He's now asking the Israeli government to censor the 10 Neset parliament members. Good luck I like that. that. <laughs> I mean, that's good. You know, that's a lot of PR. But the, it, it's an example of what they don't want. They don't want to be seen as pariahs. They do want to be seen as a modern state coming in to join their fellows at the table of science and technology. So I, to me, it's, it's both carrot and stick. I still think that's the tactic. Are there that, transplant surgeons in China that would be willing to put their lives on the line that you know of? Careers, maybe. Lives, I don't know. Careers, maybe. Got to look for them. <laughs> I, I think we'll take, we'll take three more questions. I'm going to ask the final three questioners to be fairly brief in the question. Je Jeff Gossett, Lurie Children's uh, in Chicago. Um, I'm a, transplant, a pediatric transplant cardiologist, um, but not an ethicist. One thing I would say that struck me from these conversations is that one will always be able to find an example where our rules did not work. The child who, the patient who woke up the example of an erroneous diagnosis of brain death. Um, and that list obviously could go on, including the, the child who was taken to the, to the OR and brought back to the family d despite their wishes otherwise. If you would postulate that there's always an example where this is wrong, then we simply shouldn't be in this practice, period, taking your arguments to the extreme. Obviously, I don't agree with that. Um, and so the question becomes, at what point do we find a reality of what we do that a discussion with a family has a right to accept that that family should have been allowed to donate. We allow our patients' families to not accept donation. We had a baby whose parents clearly expressed understanding, did not want a transplant, and the baby died. We allowed that to happen. Why shouldn't we allow the parents who, whose child goes to the OR to be allowed to be a, be a, donate, uh, to be a donor? Um, I think we place artificial barriers without... Um, by setting these rules, the question is where we set them and why we as a society place these when you obviously both spend a lot of time thinking about this and have very different views. Not, the legal question, I think, is different than the uh, medical care question. I, I'm not really, I kept sitting down because I'm not sure I'm phrasing this as a question. Just two comments. One, not directly on what you were talking about in terms of peds, but just the uh, anecdote issue. A couple of years ago now, just at this time of year, there was a story about a man in Belgium uh, 
who uh, Ram Yubin was his name, who allegedly had been uh, in a permanent vegetative state for 17 years and then woke up and began to write a book. Um, I looked into that case because it seemed to me unlikely, although I guess the Newsweek thing may be not so. But in any event, the point isn't so, and in fact, it wasn't true. He had been writing a book with facilitated communication, and the people helping him write the book were the authors, and he had not written the book. It, it, people had hoped. But I don't know the Newsweek book. I do know the Yubin story, and I do know that Sanjay Gupta, the estimable doctor of television, um, wrote a book uh, two years ago in which he talked a lot about people waking up and miraculous recoveries, and we can never be sure who's really dead. The culture has a very strong interest in finding out that hope always goes on. So even though these anecdotes are rare, they really come flying out, and it relates to something that we're all concerned about, which is the implications in one area of practice for the rest of practice. I know firsthand from listening to some ethics consults that people will say, I read Gupta's book, and there's always a chance that despite you saying he's brain dead, which isn't PBS, but that's what they heard, that he's going to wake up or he could wake up, so we must continue. I don't know how to handle the sociology of all of that, but it's there, and I think our culture wants to drive toward a kind of belief in resurrection of a sort that might be religious or who knows, but it's in the culture. It means that we have to attend to that consistency requirement and be alert to debunking the anecdote when it comes out and it's not so. Other quicker comment, I whispered to Bob up here, you know, I got into this debate really in a strange way early because I came out in favor of trying to have anencephalic infants as donors. And it got crucified as an idea. AMA, everybody and his brother came out and opposed the suggestion. It's not far from where Bob was, is trying to go. I was trying to say the category is distinct. Maybe we could have two rule, sets of rules, one for everybody and one for anencephalics, and then we won't worry about a slippery slope. But the public reaction to the anencephalic donation with parents wanting to do it and feeling it was the only thing that would redeem this terrible thing that had happened to them and so on was really, really negative. It, it, it's just that we may sell the dead donor rule ourselves and have convinced the public that they better stand by that rule in a way that we don't understand. But I, you know, looking back at that experience, does the dead donor rule really matter? It sure did in that one. You know, despite parents who are willing and no harm to the infant and all the rest of it, we, I, that policy went nowhere. No. Except Cal Stiller in Canada. Yeah, Cal Stiller did a few, but that even petered out after right. a time. Yeah. Yeah. Tracy. Tracy Kugler, University of Chicago. Um, I'm a PICU doctor. I declare brain death and I've done DCD. I really wonder I agree that neither death is perfect. Um, and I also have a talk of, are they dead yet? <laughs> um, but I think that families, when the heart has stopped, see the patient as dead. And I think declaring death in the PICU is a better place to do it than declaring death in the OR after the organs have been taken. I will tell you, since. I think I've done all of the DCD donors at this institution in pediatrics. I hate declaring those kids dead. <laughs> and I'm 100% in favor of it, and I hate doing it. They're the hardest kids I have to declare dead. And I feel like that if we go to taking the organs while they're more alive than <laughs> TCD, that we're just turning it over to our transplant surgeons and I think that becomes a much bigger conflict. Okay, I mean, you know, I, mean, I do this too, and I want, I want you to know that uh, um, none of what you heard up here shows up when I'm in the intensive care unit. I toe the line completely, okay? Um, I make the diagnosis of brain death, I use all the right language. I mean, it's not fair for me okay. to come into that environment and, 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 and bring a different vision. Yeah. Although I do feel that there's a lot of indications that we're moving in that di direction. Um, and um, you know, I don't, I don't know how to uh, uh, address what feels most comfortable for us, and, and, and 
and everything else. I mean, I, I found different parents have different views, and uh, I think it's hard to generalize.